Today's scriptures are from the lectionary selections for today, and they are admittedly challenging, both of them. The one from the Old Testament book of Joshua is Joshua after having led the children of Israel into the promised land, the generation that made it. He gave them a history lesson, reminding them of God's miraculous acts of power for their ancestors, literally summarizing the exodus out of bondage in Egypt and how God brought them into the promised land and admonished them to renew their covenant with God. Then Joshua and the people go back and forth, the text that's in between that's left out, they go back and forth about whether or not the people can put away other gods and serve the Lord. The whole back and forth discussion, which continues well into chapter 24, to my ears sounds threatening, antagonistic and uncomfortable. Let's listen, starting with verse 16. Then the people answered, God forbid that we ever leave the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord is our God. He is the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. He has done these mighty signs in our sight. He has protected us the whole way we've gone and in all the nations through which we've passed. The Lord has driven out the nations before us, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you can't serve the Lord because he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He won't forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you leave the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn around and do you harm and finish you off, in spite of having done you good in the past. Then the people said to Joshua, no, the Lord is the one we will serve. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. They said, we are witnesses. So now put aside the foreign gods that are among you. Focus your hearts on the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and will obey him. They finally get there. But after what seems like, again, to my ears, my ears aren't ancient ears. My ears are in this century. But it sounds like a psychological banter back and forth to push the Israelites into a corner until they promise to serve the Lord and only the Lord. And it doesn't stop there. Let's listen to what happens next. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and established just rule for them at Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in God's instruction scroll. Then he took a large stone and put it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, this stone will serve here as a witness against us because it has heard all the Lord's words that he spoke to us. It will serve as a witness against you in case you aren't true to your God. Then Joshua sent the people away to each one's legacy. That was rough, but they got there. Tough strategy, not judging Joshua. My, my history professor taught me, don't judge the past, you weren't there. But, but it was a tough strategy from my view. But, but for those people in that moment, they got there. And I wonder how long a commitment using that strategy today would last. In our New Testament scripture, again in the lectionary, meaning assigned for this week along with the Old Testament text, a long time ago these, these were selected for the lectionary, but this New Testament text is a parable that Jesus tells about ten bridesmaids, five of them wise, five of them foolish. The meaning of the parable on the surface seems to be that Jesus is the bridegroom and that he will return again. Those who are wise will keep oil for their lamps and so that their lamps are lit. In other words, they are staying ready and preparing for Jesus' return. 
And although they may sleep a bit before he returns, when he does, they've made enough preparations to be ready. The foolish in the text seem to take their discipleship lightly, and then when Jesus returns, they will scramble to try to get ready, and they miss it, and are not welcomed into God's kingdom. Phew, again. Tough words, tough sentiment seems to also invoke threat and fear, a tactic that no doubt has been used in evangelical circles to get people to give their lives to Christ, or they risk not being ready when he comes. In those times after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, it was believed that Jesus was coming back again any day now, and, and the people waited and waited, and after a while, that expectation, even the threat that you've got to be ready when he comes, is less effective when centuries passed and Jesus has not returned. It's the sacred text, and these are not the only two scriptures that take a hard line on commitment. There are others. The reality is that there is a culture of guilt and shame throughout the sacred text, and so therefore also in the practice of Christianity. In some denominations and circles, more than others, guilt and shame Today does not work as we can tell by the decline in the population of practicing church-going Christians. These two stories of the faith about seeking commitment to the faith indeed have an element of guilt and shame to my ears, maybe also to yours associated with them. But, but allow me to extract a bit from both stories to talk about the place of personal commitment in the Christian life. First of all, the presence of these scriptures in the sacred text do tell us a few things about personal commitment in the life of faith. First, that it is important. Two, that it's not easy. That there are things that compete for our time and our attention and our commitment and our focus. Three, they tell us that people have agency that we all have choices that we are free to make, free will, sometimes it's called. And, and the fourth thing that I believe these stories tell us is that our faith is not a spectator sport. It involves heart and mind and spirit and action. Here's what I know for sure. Jesus did not set out to start a religion. He was seeking to change the world. Specifically, he was seeking to usher in God's kingdom where love and justice reigns and that he intended for the disciples to engage that work and commit to it and spread it across the world. Some people are Christians, meaning they believe in Jesus and have no interest in being active beyond being part of a congregational gathering once per week. No threats from me. Each person has agency to do just that. And that is your right. There will be conditions in this world that, that one might think should change, especially over time, but those conditions might just worsen because what could have been done was left undone, but those who could have, by those who could have made a difference. Let me give you an example. Several seminaries in our community are liberal seminaries. They are liberal and they are justice oriented. They teach about justice, white supremacy, racism, sexism, homophobia, intersectionality, and they prepare future faith leaders to be justice minded leaders who can bring about positive change somewhere in the world. And, and different denominations require their clergy to go to these seminaries. As an adjunct professor right now at, at one of the seminaries, I've had multiple conversations with students. And let me say, my class is mostly white females, and they say to me that they simply cannot take those lessons to their congregations. 
that their ordination committees and denominational judicatories are telling them that they cannot preach and should not preach justice. Their congregations just don't want to hear it. They don't preach justice to, to us. They, that's what they, they tell them. And, and just be our pastor, but don't bring any oil, if I use the language of the parable. In the same class, stay with me, we talk about environmental injustices. That's what the class is about, environmental and, and racial injustice, and, and how while so much has been known about injustices and behaviors that has led to climate change and to harm of people and all of creation for so long, these things have been known after decades, nothing has changed. These same students are shocked to be reading and studying what people have known for decades and shocked that why, why is this still true today when people have known? Well, I said, well, let's connect some dots here. You know, I, I help them connect some dots, don't you? If you cannot speak justice, how can Christians know that doing justice is part of the gospel? If you've learned that Jesus says right out the gate, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, let's call that oil, to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and you come to understand that that is the gospel, and, and you feel, but you feel your hands are tied and your mouth is zipped and you can't carry that forward, or you won't have a job, when the population of those who are poor grows and oppression simply takes on a new look, like gun violence, for instance, and even hurts you and your community, how can you be disillusioned about why things never seem to get better? These stories and parables in our sacred texts are there to teach us that this is serious business that we simply cannot have it both ways. We cannot expect our communities to, be, to improve, yet be uncommitted to the lessons and the work, much less not even want to hear it. So many people don't want their comfortable cocoon to be bothered. They don't want their children to be uncomfortable. But until we realize that just as we have agency to ignore it, we also have agency to help change things for the better. Things will continue to penetrate our cocoon of safety and pleasure and peace, more uncomfortable than hearing it on Sunday. That's just the reality. And maybe that's why Joshua and Jesus went to such lengths to try to gain commitment. If you don't think Jesus took the work he charged the disciples with seriously and that this work is the work of love and justice, if you think that you should not even enter the conversation, we should not enter the conversation from the pulpit, then I encourage you to check it out all by yourself. There is a part. Certain, certainly of our faith, that is, to comfort you when you grieve. There is a part to strengthen you when you feel weak. There is a part that is to help you believe also that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you and that greater is the one that is within you than the one that is in the world. But even if you look at that closely, you'll find that it is all to bring God's reign of love to the forefront of life in every interaction. So I'm not here to say, choose ye this day whom you will serve. I'm not here to say, you don't know the day nor the hour, so you better get your house in order because Jesus is coming back again. I'm not here to say, if you don't, you'll be cast into eternal fire. You've never heard me say it. But I am here to say that there is power in faithfulness. 
There is power in our faith, power in the gospel. And I believe, I'm crazy enough to believe that it can change the world. And small acts that grow into communities of love. Like the other parable Jesus told in Matthew, in Matthew 13, 31, when he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it was the smallest of the seeds, Jesus said, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And then in verse 33, he told them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. That small acts of faith, love, and justice that you are committed to can miraculously grow and contribute to God's plans of love, justice, and peace in the world. I am not here to evoke guilt or fear, but I am here to say that Jesus, according to his teachings, intended those who believe in him to live out the gospel in very tangible ways. I am here to say that we're called to be agents of love and justice, but we can expect a world of justice if we ourselves are unwilling to actively be engaged in love and justice. What if everybody made that choice? And like Joshua, I can only speak for myself. He said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what I say for myself is, I all in. It didn't take a threat. It took much of what these stories tell. Me seeing God's hand in my life. Looking at history and seeing God's hand in the lives of my ancestors. Seeing the pain and injustices in the world and hearing the good news. Feeling compelled to commit my life to causes greater than myself feeling compelled to commit my life to causes of faith. So clearly outlined in the sacred text, feeling deep in my heart that humans can do better, especially when empowered by the Holy Spirit. Or better yet, that God could use me for good. It humbles me. Ephesians 3 and 20 states that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine according to the power that works in us. With that belief that God can work through us for good and for powerful change in the world, I'm all in. No threat or fear of hell. No twisting of my arm by anyone, just compelled by the immense love of God. And maybe that's where your commitment comes from as well. The awe of God in my life and the displays of God's creation. When I came down Woodlawn this morning and the orange and yellow trees branched over, I said, oh my God, what a wonderful God and a wonderful landscape that I get to live within. And I came on in ready to serve God. The moves of the spirit of God on my heart and on my mind and on my spirit. I'll never threaten you. That was Joshua's way, not mine. I'll never make you feel like a day will come when you will miss Jesus' return and be doomed forever. I even think that exegesis of the parable could use a little work. I think that the day or the hour that may come is one's own regret in life that they could have or should have done more in their corner of the world to do justice, love, mercy, or walk humbly, that in one's own life that they realize that they allowed apathy or influence or fear to stop them from living boldly and joyously for principles for which they believed. I do think that Jesus told the parable to express that humans have agency and that humans have regret. But also the humans have access to oil. 
And that oil is the Holy Spirit that encourages us and inspires us, and not only us, but a community of people who are also led and inspired and encouraged by the oil. I think that's why there were five bridesmaids and not one and one. We are community and we can share the oil among us and that Holy Spirit flows and leads to love, justice, and change. I felt that spirit in my life so much that I changed my profession. It changed my life and since then I've been all in and I'll be all in and I wouldn't change a thing because the power of love is incomparable. The ability to be the change you want to see in the world and to see God open doors for you to be part of that change, there is nothing more exciting and miraculous in the world. And I just want you to live the most exciting and miraculous life inspired by the Holy Spirit to bring more love and justice in the world. I believe in my heart that that's the deep purpose of that Old Testament story of Joshua. And I believe in my heart that that's the meaning of the parable. And I know for sure that that's what Jesus wanted for his followers. After all, it was Jesus who said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And what's more abundant than doing work that allows someone else to live an abundant life as well? For me, I'm all in. God bless you.